Are investors still resilient, positive that the Kenyan market will do well? Well, uh, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon from wherever you are. I'm your host, Jesse, with yet another episode of Bullish Banter. I hope you enjoyed the last one and definitely the markets have been quite gracious with you the last couple of days. We'll cover a bit of that, but of course, before I go further, Rufus. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good. Yes. Uh, so far, markets have been uh, wild mm-hmm. and calm at the same time. Interesting, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have like several days, nothing is moving. Then all of a sudden, uh, it's like somebody threw a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, in the last couple of days, we have seen a very quick recession, recovery, market crash, Black Monday, panic, extreme panic, extreme joy. Yeah. All sorts of emotions. So for the new traders, perhaps, maybe just as an FYI, there will be more of that. Yeah, yeah a lot more. <laughs> a lot more. Not recent in the recent future, but definitely as you will be involved with this business. Not to worry or be scared, but rather to take it as, or relish the opportunity it provides. We'll begin with Kenya, as usual. Um, recently, we had the uh, Monetary Policy Committee meeting, you know, cutting rates by around 25 people basis points. And uh, I think I mentioned this la- earlier, but uh, if the, I think when we were talking about central bank divergence, if they have been able to curb it at below their, you know, medium tar- target of 5%, they should at least ease the economy anticipating interesting things. But that is not even at least the most interesting thing that they have done. The most interesting thing is the auction results of the reopened uh, infrastructure bond, which got really good over subscription. Yeah. Are investors still resilient, you know, in trusting that the Kenyan market will do well, or it's a case of uh, those who participated in bidding for the bonds yeah. are a small cocoon of investors. Well, uh, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> yeah. The way I would think about it yeah. is that uh, as per the central bank's previous meeting, there was a very heated political environment, and there was a lot of fear around investing in bonds Remember in that episode, we mentioned the undersubscription. There yes. Was, there was one bond that got up around 4.2%. Per, uh, yes. Sir. Yeah. So judging from that moment to today, mm-hmm. a lot of things have come down. The, the daily protests have really gone down. And uh, some confidence is back. On the other hand, the high rate of subscription only screams about the economy. Like, uh, where else are you going to put that money? Is there like an option? Mm. Uh, A lot of investors don't have alternatives where they can invest money and get the same returns compared to what the government is offering. And might I add lower risk, low risk uh, uh, sort of investment uh, vehicle? Well, there are days we would say bonds are very low risk, but right now Uh, uh, you say that with a hint of salt. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I saw that and I was like, okay, because um, by the time they auctioned it, mm. there was no much confidence at the time. Yeah. I think when they released the uh, the entire prospectus. Yeah. But given the performance and um, and they are long term, they are not like six years and seventeen years. Yeah. Uh, it means I think I said it earlier that investors are either willing to invest in short term, one year, yeah. six months, just yeah. under two years, yeah. or long term, post whatever political changes, especially with the upcoming election in 2027, yeah. they are confident that if things go the way they do, yeah. and basing on what actually led to those uh, demonstrations in the first place, yeah. they call for accountability, fiscal responsibility, monetary yeah. responsibility, yeah. maybe the economy would get back in line yeah. and therefore not only will our production go up or even our tax revenue go up, yeah. but also uh, foreign investment might come in. So I guess uh, that is maybe the bet a lot of traders are taking in, at I, least from I think, my side. I think uh, it's some form of recency bias. Okay. Uh, people tend to put more weight on uh, information that just came recently uh, okay. compared to the past. Uh-huh. So for a person who has been investing in bonds and putting what, uh, 10, 20 year bonds for the past couple of uh, decades, then when they are judging the events that transpired since June this year, they are also looking at other political environments where the same happened and the economy was resilient enough to make sure that things went well. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, if you look at, uh, as we record this on the 14th of August, Kenya shilling is now back below 130. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you combine all these factors, uh, political tension is down. Mm. Are you worried of the exchange rate or like myself, happy that at least despite everything going on, yeah. there's some degree of stability on that side? Well, I'm happy with a strong shilling at any given time. Okay. But when it comes to projections for the next one year, that is where things get. I, I am very worried. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah. uh, of course, we'll always be hopeful and positive, yeah. but expecting whatever. Well, uh, for me, I'm looking at the data. Yeah. So the number of maturities we have by the same time next year, yeah. uh, compared to how the economy is performing, uh, the politics we are seeing, the policies with the uh, finance bill 2023, 2024. Mm. Uh, all those indicators are not showing a very rosy picture for the Kenya shilling. Interesting. Yeah. Now, as we go back, uh, rather go now, taking a flight global markets on the 5th of August, what a morning, right? Yeah. <laughs> With uh, everyone looking at, uh, you know, um, Nikkei falling over 20%, uh, and uh, yeah. Basically, the entire global market was in red. Um, what did you make of that and how everything has panned out within the last 10 or so days? Well, I would say uh, <clears throat> Japan retail triggered a big sell-off across the board. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was with a very slight, uh, or I would call it small, increase in interest rates. Yeah. So they have done two interest rate hikes uh, this year. First one was 20 basis points uh, in March from negative 0.1% to positive 0.1%. So they added 15 basis points to 0.25% this entry, and that really strengthened the yen. So looking at the chart of USDN, uh, we saw the yen strengthening about 11% against the dollar. And that triggered a massive reverse carry trade. And uh, I'll try to explain it this way. Uh, over the past two decades, interest rates in Japan have remained relatively low. And by low, I mean uh, near zero or even below zero. Yeah. So it made it possible for a lot of investors to borrow cash from Japan and then invest in areas where you'd get a higher yield, uh, mainly U.S. treasuries as well as uh, U.S. stocks. Even some money found itself in cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. So now you're looking at an event where the Bank of Japan raises interest rates, of course, that would correspond with the lenders in Japan also increasing interest rates. So if you have debts in Japanese yen from financial institutions in Japan, those the cost of servicing those debts go up, right? Yeah. So now you have another challenge. Your debt is denominated in JPY. So the JPY has been weakening to the dollar and uh, that means that your obligations are getting less and less. But now the Japanese yen increases over 11% in a very short period of time. Yeah. And that's a scary moment because your debt actually goes up by 11%. So when you combine those two, and then you compare with what was happening in the US, uh, we are looking at a likely potential rate cut by September this year. So if there's a rate cut, then that means we could be seeing yields from bonds going down. Mm. So it's basically forcing people to return money to Japan. Okay. So that scare caused out of panic, and we saw the unwinding, which led to a big sell-off in the Nikkei, which was down over 27%. Uh, SP500 was down about 17%. Mm. Uh, sorry, that was the Nasdaq, it yeah. was the most volatile. Uh, we saw the... SP500 dumping, European equities dumping. But then all of a sudden, we saw uh, markets basically uh, resuming to normalcy. Uh, so far, the Nikkei to 25 index has recovered more than 50% of the move. Okay. So we saw uh, the Bank of Japan governors saying that they're not going to hike interest rates again because they have seen what other hikes can do. Yeah, I saw that statement and they were like, wow. This guy has decided, unlike Powell, yeah. I will tell you what I will not do, yeah. and then you will deal with that information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think even the entire most participants, if you have been following a more central bank 
uh, speeches or statements, yeah. they are rarely direct as, uh, I think the name of, was it Fumio or something? The, Yabushida. Yeah. And he mentioned that and he was like, wow, okay. Yeah. At least that is good yeah. for the time being. Yeah. I, uh, I think now what they have done is basically thrown the ball back to Powell yeah. because if he doesn't act and he has been given a grace period, because I would say if he had acted, let's say, on the 31st of July, yeah. the market would have possi- probably reacted negatively a bit, but not yeah. in a shocking manner. Yeah. I think uh, the markets, from my observation, I always thought that July was the best time for them to do a small cut yeah. and then anticipate the others to do it. But for some reason, I believe they wanted to maintain that dollar strength to the end. Yeah. It also becomes positive for them on that uh, debt, uh, g- which they have a significant portfolio to Japan yeah. and they have the advantage. But uh, clearly, the shock was really uh, massive. But my my only concern, or rather, I know there was a lot of fear and there's a lot of panic, and I don't think that is over. Yeah. I think we are in a small break so far, yeah. or rather an half time. A breather. A, br- a breather. <laughs> yeah. But definitely it's a warning sign that something is about to come. Yeah. And when when you see, for me, whenever you see the markets react negatively just on interest rates, uh, you know, we have been calling the central bank divergence. Yeah. What would be very worrying if it would be if, uh, let's say, those who are in the, you know, mortgage business, real estate uh, businesses. You remember, I think, yeah. was it early in this year when Canada also had to cut rates because the rent were getting, yeah. the rent inflation was getting uh, out of hand. Yes. That would be my worry. And then the uh, last year we had a lot of banks within the real estate uh, segment as well yeah. suffering from not being able to uh, service their customer in terms of liquidity. Yeah. And they had to seek for taps uh, from the, uh, you know, Federal Reserve. Yeah. Going forward, I know a lot of calls in the market that either cut rates or do this and that. Yeah. But uh, as we have seen at, at, within the last couple of data, you know, uh, yeah. yes, as of yesterday, CPI didn't come in, let's yeah. say, impressive yeah. as much yeah. compared to maybe the producer's PPI numbers. Yeah. What do you make of that, at least in relation to the strength of dollar for the next maybe couple of days? Well, uh, I would like to start with Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, clearly, in the current market environment, Japan is the driver. Okay. So if Japan, uh, Japan's monetary policy mm. uh, turns into a certain direction, it's, we, we have seen it in action. It's affecting other markets. Yes. So Japan is currently trapped in this environment where unemployment is rising, uh, inflation is uh, significantly high, mm-hmm. and uh, they need to handle that because it's becoming political. You saw the uh, Prime Minister of Japan resigning the other yes, day. Yes, yesterday. Yes, the, that would be on Tuesday evening. Yes. So it's becoming very heated because when you have, uh, you're running a country and people are getting less jobs, mm-hmm. uh, prices are going up, and they want you to change monetary policy to support them, uh, then it becomes a big problem. So okay. in order to tighten policy, they have to hike interest rates. But they have seen that if they do it too rapidly, then it's impacting other markets, including their own stock market, which they cannot afford to cause a crash. And I guess if you look at the numbers, maybe for traders or listeners, they can be able to go and look further into the data. Yeah. Something which I know caused a lot of worry for them is that a lot of pension funds yeah. uh, are invested in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Nikkei market. Yeah. And then also the Central Bank, the Bank of Japan itself yeah. is also invested heavily on the ETFs yeah. tracking the market. So if they are not able to maybe manage the country's finances and maybe make mal investments, yeah. it would definitely affect either people's savings yeah. or actually the value of their money as we know it. Eh? I think that was the major, let's they, say, concern <laughs> from their side. They literally have an aging population. Exactly. So a majority of the guys are old. Yeah. Uh, these old guys have their money in in the pension schemes <laughs> that are invested in the stock market. Yeah. Because they could not invest in bonds yeah. because for the last fourteen years they had capped the bonds at around what one percent. One percent. Yes. Yeah. So all the money is in the Nikkei. Like. Like that is which is giving them good returns. Yeah. Now it's down twenty seven percent in like a month. Uh, somebody's gonna resign. 
<laughs> Isn't that very worrisome yeah. on a general perspective whereby yeah. uh, you put your eggs in one basket. Yeah. And that basket breaks. Yeah. I remember some time back when we were talking about uh, Nvidia. I don't know if I mentioned it like the top 10 companies. Yes. If they perform negatively, yeah. The entire stock market goes down. If they do even all of the mag 7 yeah. as we know it, yeah. do a 7% plus dive, yeah. the entire Nasdaq will go down by at least 4%. Yeah. And that is a worrying to the economy that if all this pension fund yeah. US and even global even Kenya I know some companies in Kenya do invest in global equities yes they are able to do um, uh, uh, even 10% of their portfolio on yeah. such a market as much as it offers good, great returns over time yeah that volatility can maybe alter how they view it because mm. like you said it's an aging population yeah and in this era that we are in yeah. very few let's i would say fund managers yeah were active enough in the market to witness the GFC of 28 yeah myself included yeah. the 99 bubble yeah and probably the yeah. 78 uh, yeah we only read it in history exactly we yeah. read it and yeah. therefore is it quite worrying that the i would say good companies trading like meme stock yeah. have pension funds invested in them <laughs> it's not good it's not good exactly uh, and therefore i think uh-huh. I think it's time to start learning from uh, Norway's sovereign wealth fund. Very good. Those guys are really well diversified. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think also given uh, uh, the recent one which I've seen also they have started being more or less proactive yeah. and less reactive was the Saudi wealth fund yeah. which they have now started uh, for those who are interested they can check on the Bloomberg latest news on it. Yeah. They have started asking fund managers like BlackRock, yeah. uh, Vanguard and the rest, okay, we will give you this money. Yeah. I know you will get us 20% from wherever. Yeah. But what else? Yeah. They are they are not looking at the number. Yeah. What else are you offering for all this money? Can we get more? Can we actually get more less your fees and less your staffers and everything? Yeah. Can we get some innovation? All the lazy old investing whereby yeah. if the stock market fails or, yeah. or my, I would say correct itself, yeah. we are not going to force now the Fed day mm. Poel, do something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's what I'm seeing. I don't like the way we are whereby <laughs> the market are forcing yeah. regulators yeah. to act. Yeah. Uh let's bring it home. Uh-huh. Uh, the last time the Nairobi Securities Exchange was really doing well and yeah. reasonably well mm. uh, in a diversified manner, like not just one or two companies doing well, uh, that was 2015. Uh, if you compare the performance of now the NSE with uh, pension funds in Kenya, especially the NSF, uh, there, ha- there has been so much exposure yeah. that it doesn't make sense. Those guys need to get diversified. Exactly. Yeah. And and I guess if if they are not able to change yeah. and things start rupturing, yeah. it will not be a good scene going forward. Yeah. Now, back to what I would let's say be looking at in the next couple of days and I know a lot of traders will be doing that. Yeah. Gold has been let's say toying with us on 2780, 2500 yeah. and I think this is based on escalating uh you know uh tensions yeah. globally or even just fearful that there might be issues with the dollar in the coming days. Yeah. Are we getting into a point where by, you know, I mean we had tried to get ourselves off this every time you are watching central bank, central bank, central bank. Yeah. Is there anything in the future that you'd say maybe if the Fed cuts would that ease the market because if you look at all the chat about trading, yeah. personally I've decided to say I will use what they have done before. Yeah. If they don't see their core data doing anything positive, ignore the Fed and expect this to happen. Yeah. And therefore the market will react negatively but the Fed will just say, eh, yeah. you do your thing." Yeah. So long as Japan <laughs> is not making us panic, yeah. we'll be good with that. Yeah. Are we looking to at a such a situation? Well, um first of all with the uh, gold Uh, I think there is a uh, multiple factors that are contributing to the current rally in gold. Uh-huh. Uh one of them uh is that the average family in China has their biggest investment in real estate. Then we know what has happened with uh, Evergrande, yeah. uh Country Garden, some of the top top uh, Chinese real estate companies have really turned and I believe that's within the last three years. So these guys are left with a uh, a few other options to put their money in. So if you look at the Chinese stock market, it has been on a bear market since 2020. Yeah. Uh that's uh actually 2019. So that's for almost five years now. 
uh, of bear market. We had some good performance in the earlier months of the year. Yeah, true. Right? I remember. Before the, the stock market tanked again. Mm -hmm. So these guys don't have a lot of areas where they can put money. So they concentrated their investments in gold. And by buying gold, they are basically buying the ETFs. And the ETFs are actually buying gold. Yeah. So that has been a key driver in the current bull market. So the other thing has been uh, the interest rate cycle. So we saw interest rates being cut in 2020. Uh, they remained low for a while. Then in 2021, 2022, central banks started hiking interest rates. So they pushed them to the limits. At some point, I remember uh, Jerome Powell saying that this is the highest we are going. We are not going to hike anymore now. People started speculating on rate cuts. Yeah. So from that moment, when you compare, when central banks said we are not hiking anymore, that's when gold started making the big move upwards. Okay, interesting. So you, uh, it's not like you would say, yes, besides the trying to secure your future, yeah. but also, you know, I normally say gold, you trade it two ways. Yeah. One as a commodity yeah. and one as a currency. Yeah. And every time commodity, trading it as a commodity, yeah. by commodity, I mean hard asset, whereby people just generally want gold itself, yeah. it always drives the, because I, yeah. I would say that is the real price of the metal yeah. as opposed to, you know, it yeah. as a derivative. Yeah. When you trade it like that, you're able to actually Con, not corner, but rather make some good speculation on where the prices will actually end. Yes. So I think that is one thing. Yeah. Now, um, I was looking at today's morning retail sales numbers, and if you looked at Apple's yeah. number uh, from yeah. last quarter, yeah. uh, their sales on iPhones in China or Asia in specific was really going down. Yeah. But today the numbers uh, at least is looking to, it has increased by 0.1%. Yeah. Are we seeing that now perhaps with everything going on globally, yeah. maybe the Chinese consumer is getting much more uh, better with yeah. their disposable income? Well, China has been uh, enjoying like extremely low inflation. Yeah. Uh, this year, I don't think they have gone over 1%. Yeah. Uh, in fact, they were suffering with deflation at some point this year. Yes. So uh, with low inflation and the central bank cutting interest rates. Yeah, I remember uh, around early, early in the year, late last year as well. Yeah, also the central bank injecting money in the economy, especially yeah. to support real estate sector. Uh -huh. uh, it means that um, asset prices are going up in China, uh, money is cheaper in China. So in that kind of environment, you find that the purchasing power really goes up. Okay. So um, I saw who, uh, this guy who shorted the market into seven to eight. Um, the guy yeah, who is uh, who did the fun, big short movie. Fun question. Will yeah. uh, our so, audience will answer it? I, if I remember <laughs> the name. Yeah. Michael Barry. Yeah. yeah, Michael Barry. Yeah, like he literally bought a big big position in Chinese stocks. Okay. And uh, that was uh, in filings that were made earlier this week. Okay. So. We are seeing a lot of people going for the Chinese market, mainly because there are those conditions that if you are to compare with the US, those conditions were only there during COVID. You Remember when um, mm. the interest rates in the US were cut to close to zero? Yeah. Uh, the engaged quantitative easing and inflation was still close to zero. Yeah. So that environment is now currently in China. Uh, so that they will get spending soon. Yeah. Yeah. In that regard, just on a side note, if uh, if the Chelsea deal with the Chinese tire manufacturer goes through, yeah. I guess they can spend some money on the EPL. <laughs> 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 Interesting that you mentioned that because I was yeah. looking also at an, at Alibaba, yeah. which seems to be at on a good uh, bullish momentum. Yeah. And I guess that goes to show that uh, the uh, consumer expenditure of a lot of uh, Chinese is getting better. Yeah. Would you say with the with the with the retail sales going up, I see the production still maintain the same based on today's data. Yeah. And uh, would we say that once at least the global uh, scale sort of settle, whereby if the Fed had to cut one and they were done with their speeches and everything, yeah. we might be able to see now, um, you know, uh, because I personally believe the stocks will be bullish, yeah. uh, not an investment advice, yeah. will be bullish based on a lot of fundamentals being positive to it. Yeah. Are we likely to see now the dollar index itself going below the one or two level if at all Chinese are quite doing well and uh, Fed cut and weaken to some degree their dollar, if you factor in the political environment going on right now whereby yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, both candidates are basically all of them agreeing to be conservative, cutting and removing taxes on everything. Well, uh, I believe the dollar will move a little bit lower. Okay. And uh, there are some key signs to observe. Yes. One, gold is performing better than SP500. Interesting. Yeah, uh-huh. it's they are literally pacing each other. Okay. And uh, there's a good chance gold will end the year with a better return. Okay. Uh, the other thing is... Uh, Despite the current correction that we are seeing. Yeah. Okay. The other thing is your guy, uh, Warren Buffett. Yes. $277 billion worth of cash position. And he's still offloading, by the way. Yeah. He's still offloading. This is the highest he has ever held in, in, in terms of cash. Okay. Which means that that's a big, big signal. Okay. Uh, he sold over half of his position in Apple. Mm. And uh, now with such a big uh, cash position, it means that he's uh, predicting or projecting or expecting some form of market crash in the near future. And as he always does, you guys panic, he buys a cheap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Interesting. It's a big signal. Gold, uh, Warren Buffett cash, cash position. Mm-hmm. Uh, then uh, the yen reverse carry trade. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's not like things are not going to heat up in Japan. Because if you think of Japan, the country is importing almost 100% of its oil. Yeah. So if their currency keeps losing value, oil is becoming very expensive for them. And they do pay it in yen yes. as opposed to most countries which pay it in dollars. So that really is yeah. can be a big scare to them. Yeah. If for any reason whatsoever, yeah. the price of uh, oil goes above 80. Now imagine if they had to sell some of their bonds in the US yeah. to pay for oil. Okay. So that that's also a signal. Like yeah. whatever Japan does, whatever Warren Buffett does, whatever gold does, and of course, uh, most importantly, uh, Jerome Powell. Mm-hmm. So if he decides to go for a big rate cut in yeah. September, mm-hmm. you know he can also do 50. We have yeah. seen a lot of surprises this year. We saw a surprise red card from New uh, Zealand. New Zealand yes, th- this week. Day. Yes. Uh, the Bank of Canada red card was a surprise. Mm. Uh, the, the ECB red card was a surprise. And it is coming again soon. Yeah. It should be. So all these surprises by central banks mm-hmm. uh, means that there are certain extremes that the economies are reaching yeah. where central banks have or must react to what's happening. For me, I think if yeah. if if um, from a policy perspective and an investor's perspective, eh? yeah. <clears throat> excuse, if 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 we are going to use the Fed's mandatory limit of two percent yeah. with the current, you know, uh, how the economy is going and globally intertwined, yeah, it will not work if they stick to it. They they might either adjust it or use different metrics to measure yeah. what two percent actually means. Because yeah. if you look at the core CPI, which is around uh two point nine hours of yesterday, excluding the you know the yeah. inflationary if inflationary products like housing, oil and everything, yeah. it has resisted to go below three percent significantly. Yeah. And even if it went earlier on in the year, the yeah. Fed did not ask. Yeah. Uh, act yeah. uh, uh, just to add on to your point on factors which are driving you know uh, the dollar to weaken. Yeah. One interesting fact I saw recently was that uh, the US is one of the largest producers now, beating even Aramco from Saudi yeah. Arabia. Yeah. And uh, if you match that with all what is happening, central bank easing on their policy yeah. or rather being less restrictive. Yeah. You combine that with uh, you know Japan, which are buying in yen, and they would prefer the yen to be a little bit stronger. Yeah. And the U.S. definitely being one of the largest uh, debtors to Japan, and uh, obviously uh, they would, their actions have significant implications and investments on their side. Yeah, you would expect that if Fed were to act in the coming days, as we put it, or as the market rather expects it to do. Yeah, going again by the comments we have seen after that Monday crash, they weren't really worried. Yeah, they were. They would be. I I, I think most of the commentaries were. If the housing rent was going, inflation was going higher yeah. compared to maybe the foods, yeah. they would be worried. Yeah. Or it would cause a lot of banks to be in panic mode, especially on cash ratios. Yeah. But right now we are seeing US is basically controlling price of oil with the mass yeah. production. Yeah. So that's a good thing for the yen yeah. or the Bank of Japan. Uh, the Bank of Japan has basically assured the market we are done. In fact, if anything, yeah. we, are, we might cut just to make everyone easy. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, that is another thing. So if those two combine together and both six statements yesterday that we are looking for more data yeah. and we go back to that GDP is still good. Yeah. If we see retail sales numbers today better than uh, normal, yeah. I think that can be a good thing. Yeah. 
we might actually get surprised next month. They say it's still on the table. The normal sentiments <laughs> we are considering. We are still data dependent. Well, the two sales have been uh, on a down downward spiral this year. Yes, in the US. Okay. Uh, the I think the highest we have seen is like three point two. Okay. Then two point seven, and two point six, two point four. Okay. So retail sales have been weakening, and that's a key concern for the US. Uh, uh, let me put another way. Mm. What are, if you look at the earnings report, Apple literally beat their yeah. revenue targets and everything. Yeah. Walmart also did well. Yeah, they, they um, had, Walmart had their day. Uh, uh, their, uh, yes. Uh, what do you call them? Um, it's more like a brief Black Friday, but now yeah. for Walmart. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And Amazon really did well. Yeah. So as much as, yes, let's say retail numbers have been down, yeah. the companies within the retail and services sector yeah. are still doing well financially. Yeah. So if the Fed were to worry, maybe some banks are invested heavily yeah. in equity would yeah. be suffering. Yeah. I guess the only people which is generally suffer, which are generally suffering yeah. are those who have taken maybe personal loans on the higher end. Of course, so, yeah. if the Fed has been backing up these uh, big banks, yeah. uh, which have been backing up the, let's say, the real estate mm-hmm. and the hedge funds yes. and so on. At some point, the Fed may have to backstop the consumer himself. Okay. Uh, the credit card delinquencies, especially for 90 days, are getting worse. That is now a cost of days, worry. Even yeah. worse. Yeah. And it's something that the Fed can actually adjust Okay. with a click of a button. Remember Kashkari said um, the Fed can print unlimited money? True. Yeah. So, uh, there's a good question you asked, whether it's right that uh, people having pensions uh, or put in the stock market, and some of these stocks are trading like meme stocks, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's right. It's even worse in the US. <laughs> it's really worse. Everything um, like Americans are working for yeah. uh, has been put into the financial system. And due to greed, uh, out of this money found itself in the stock market. Okay. So the, there's no way the Fed is going to let the stock market crash. Definitely. So if there's one good bet to be looking forward to, yeah. I think it's the U.S. stock market. Now, there is something I, I, I deliberately avoided as we are covering yeah. why maybe we are looking at a weaker dollar for the next few days. Yeah. Bitcoin. Yes. <laughs> so Bitcoin is still behaving as a risk asset. Yes. So, uh, But still... Yeah. One thing I noticed, sorry for cutting you, yeah. is that even though we had a sell off which was major, yeah. I would say typical of Bitcoin, be it in a week or in a day, yeah. how it resiliently came back upwards yeah. while the dollar continued to weaken is one of the most interesting things I've seen. I think the same move you can see it on gold, yeah. but not in the stock market, which is normal. Yeah. And DXY really suffered yeah. significantly even right now. Yeah. Uh-huh. So what has been happening with uh, with Bitcoin uh, is not more of an investor risk on risk off sentiment. So if you look at gold, you can see those cycles happening. Investors are risk on, now they are risk off. Um, if you look at the top holders of Bitcoin, they are net long and like extremely long. Okay. Meaning that uh, if you look at uh, BlackRock, yeah. Since the, the ETFs, year started, yeah. they have accumulated over five hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. Okay. So these other ETFs have been accumulating smaller numbers. Okay. But all they've been doing is just buying and buying and buying and buying. Okay. It's only one ETF that was selling. Okay. Mainly because their fees were expensive and clients were trying to rotate to cheaper ETFs. Uh, so overall, it basically shows you that the changes or the volatility we are seeing in Bitcoin is as a result of a transfer of wealth from some people who don't have conviction mm-hmm. to some people who have conviction. Yeah. I, I don't expect that uh, that BlackRock will be selling if there's a dump to 58K. It's an opportunity for them to also test those very crazy moves to the upper side. Yeah. I think that marks at least to some degree the end of today's uh, you know episode on some of the uh, fundamental factors and uh, situations that have happened. Perhaps maybe I could post this question to you then, yeah. at least in the coming days. I know we have the Jackson Hole Symposium yeah. where Paul will be speaking. Yeah. I think that can give some perspective on what they might do next month. Yeah. Um, and of course, Olympics is over, IPL is coming. What are you bullish on for the next maybe one or two weeks before we come well, again? I'm bullish on Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, we have a pretty big squad. Okay. Yeah, so we have a lot of options. Okay. Uh, in terms of markets, yeah. Uh, personally, I like I'm really invested in Bitcoin. Okay. So I'm very bullish. Okay. I have seen these guys are just accumulating. Okay. They but can only mean one thing. Mm-hmm. So on the charts trading side, yeah. uh, there's quite a number of things. Uh, the Bank of Japan uh, or Ministry of Finance or whoever is running the ETF yeah. owns a very big chunk of the Nikkei 225 index. Okay. Uh, the market crashed 28%. The Prime Minister resigned. Okay. The market has uh, resumed, has gained over 14% mm. of the 28% it had lost. Mm in a very short period, I think in the last three weeks. Okay. So looking at the next two or three weeks, I'm looking at even more recovery in the K225 index. Okay. For me, the bant of the day yeah. would be Elon Musk. You remember when um, we had that discussion, Elon Musk versus Warren Buffett? Yeah. I'm starting to jump off that ship. <laughs> yeah. I do not want to be associated with <laughs> Musk at all. Um <laughs> Yeah. You, 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 his politics are okay, yeah. but if you let's say looking at Tesla as a company, mm-hmm. he is involved in so much cases and and mm-hmm. things that you wonder. Yeah. Okay, are we going to get anything innovative? Because if you look at the li- the latest uh, earnings report, yeah. the robo taxis yeah. are basically being pushed forward, pushed forward, yeah. and no real time debts or better testing that would say yeah. this product can actually generate revenue. Now, um, with the political statements you have seen of late, I mean, Twitter, for me, mm-hmm. how I see it and how he runs it, is basically like when uh, Zach was there, mm. Jack rather was there, yeah. but uh, it appeared like it was on the liberal side. Yeah. Now he's just a full-on MAGA, not even conservative. Yeah. He's a full-on MAGA. Yeah. He's basically doing what he wanted to do, but on the other side. Yeah. But I would want to see yeah. the impact on it. Yeah to the election outcome, not do, opinions. Do you know that earlier today, mm. Tesla was uh, announced as the biggest car, car manufacturer in the US? Yes. Like it has beat all those pre-existing brands. Some of them are over 100 years old and now Elon is producing more cars than them. Well, Ferrari is 100 years old plus, right? Yeah. It, does it matter? Well, it matters. Yeah, uh, like of, there so have been new brands that have come. My point is, mm. like... Um, Tesla is doing all right. It's a good company. Yeah. Longevity will determine how long it lasts. Yeah. But you see, when you are when you are blended up in a political situation whereby yeah. everything is for convenience yeah. and not long term convenience, yeah. short term convenience. We have just talked about pension fund being trying to invest in companies which have longevity yeah. in their vision and everything. Yeah. You look at it and how it behaves and all these lawsuits coming up yeah. and you're like, okay, there'll be a lot of fines to be paid. Yeah. And like we saw last week, the oh. market has become yeah. significantly sensitive to anything negative yeah. and any reaction might ha- catch you on the wrong side. Yeah. So that is my band of the day, of course. I think I'll give you an assignment. Yes. Just show me one investor yeah. who has made a big impact or a big Lump sum amount of money betting against Elon Musk. No, I'm not betting against him. Well, like, you uh, are. <laughs> it's just he's, a, he's my bant of the day. Like no. the, guy, the guy is doing some crazy stuff. Um, yes. but I'm not he like has saying, always been yeah, crazy. I'm, yeah, he's doing some crazy stuff this time. Yeah. He's like he's on a harder roll and all the everything yeah. that you can think of is just yeah. going weird. Are you buying Starlink? Sorry, I am getting it soon. Ah. Yes, nice. I'm getting it soon. So it's, you are attacking or defending? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the activity that you have done. See, you, you know, we are talking about the next coming days or the previous week, right? Yeah. Yeah. Recently, you have just been doing some crazy stuff. Yeah. Other than that, yeah. we'll see. I'm getting sterling. I think it's uh, for my home, yeah. back in the village. Yeah. I will definitely get it. Ah, yeah. nice. Yeah. That's been all, of course, for this episode of Bullish Banter. Um, should you have anything to add on or a question to add on, especially be it on rates or where gold will be in the coming days or stock market, do not hesitate to uh, chat just below the Spotify. We appreciate your comment or question. And uh, I think uh, unless you have a closing remarks. Well, uh, I'll just say I appreciate all the listeners who have been giving us feedback. Yeah. So if you enjoyed this podcast, uh, make sure to 
uh, share with your friends. And if you have any further questions or comments, we really welcome them. Interesting. Maybe just as a surprise, yeah. Yeah. maybe we can consider bullish banter FPL since you're bullish on Chelsea. And then we see how that goes. Oh, right. <laughs> well, that, that, that's big. That's big. Uh, let's create it. Yeah. Why not? No worries. By the time this will be out, I guess uh, we'll have already have game week one. We'll see who tops on being on that team. Mm-hmm. Have yourself a wonderful day.